Today on the bench we have a Cobra 148 GTL, but this is the DX version. So this is, it's not the original, but it is a very early, what I could call, black box radio, because it's an export radio. Uh, it was not meant to be sold in this country, because it has a, uh, I guess you can't really see that, has a three band, has a low, mid, and high position. So it's a multi-band radio, as well as a, uh, it has FM and CW positions. So there's actually, uh, there are still just two jacks on the back, um, the normal one for your external speaker, but the one you would normally have for a PA speaker jack is a CW key jack. Um, I'll get into the radio, the little module hanging off the side, and some of the other things, because this has some old-school mods. So this is an older radio. But, you know, like I say, this is a, this is an early, um, you know, unit in delving into the export radio market. Uh, this is, I think, what, a PB-010 board. Um, and actually, a lot of your radios, your Ranger, you know, Ranger-made boards, if you look at those and you look at this radio... Yeah, they look really, really similar, to include a mirror board. <laughs> so, we all kind of know who kind of, uh, you know, created this layout, like I said, very similar to the Ranger chassis. It's just, Ranger makes them worse. <laughs> they took a radio that wasn't too bad, and yeah, it, and even the Ranger's early radios were about the same quality as this. It's just, their quality has just plummeted, and they're, they're now probably the worst radio made nowadays um but uh so in any case this has some old school mods in it uh customer wasn't sure what all had been done to this i just did a, a, G, a normal gtl for him installed a channel king board um he got this one he said i know it turns on and it receives something but other than that he really wasn't sure he wasn't going to test it really any farther um he just wants this one fixed up and i told him i was like it's got some old school mods and i said uh I'd kind of leave these in here. They're vintage mods and a kind of a vintage radio, and they're period correct. Um, like I said, I'll get into those. Just I know curiosity's killing you. This is a Roger Beat board, old school uh, Roger Beat board, and then it also has an old school. Now this got to remember it already has three bands, but it has an old school channel mod. Now I've got the white balance changed on my camera so I can show you some of the screens for what I'm going to show. But yeah, you can't even really see that. But there's an EEPROM in there that to uh, add some ex even more channels. Um, I'm actually in the middle of doing the, uh, yeah, I guess about the middle, of the uh, transceiver alignment on this. Um, and something I thought I'd show, because so many radios that I get in, uh, the, if they're not modified, if they don't have parts cut out or bodged in, it's one of the, what I call, all knobs right syndrome. Now, it's not using the knobs on the front there, but what they're adjusting are all the trimmers on the inside, all the trim, you know, the adjustment points for ALC, AMC, AM power, you know, all your power and modulation and limiter circuits, they're all cranked to the maximum. You know, they may not disable the circuit, but completely cranked up is honestly just about as bad, because a lot of times if you turn like ALC or AMC up, if you turn the adjustment up the whole way, and then if you were to just completely disable the circuit, yeah, they look pretty much the same. So, you know, just because you leave the AMC circuit intact, but come in here, you know, with your gold-plated screwdriver and crank everything to the maximum, don't think it's going to be okay because the circuit's still intact. You've adjusted it out of adjustment. So, I just want to show that in this one. The modulation, or the not the AM modulation, but the side, actually they both were, but the sideband ALC is horrible on this thing. Now, the circuit's unmodified. ALC and AMC circuits are still 100% intact, but it was extremely distorted, and the reason for that, the ALC was improperly adjusted. Now, the way you properly adjust the ALC circuit in a radio, now, I've done a video quite some time ago on how to make a little box, just a little small box, a little circuit board, a couple parts, um, to make a double-tone signal generator doesn't need to be fancy. I'm using big fancy communications test sets that can do that. But you don't need anything that fancy. You do need a scope, you know, an oscilloscope. Um, but if you have an oscilloscope and you make one of those little modules, you don't even have to have an actual oscilloscope. If you have a, uh, a station monitor, um, shoot, even 
uh, what the heck's the name of that company? Black Cat. What was it? Well, Wazi Black Cat. They had their old service monitors back in the, what, 70s. But, you know, you know Heathkit and ICOM also made them. Uh, you know, Kenwood, everybody, all the amateur radio companies made uh, station monitors, but they're the same thing. It's basically just an oscilloscope to allow you to look at your modulated waveform. Um, but you have, that's something you have to have. But and in addition to that, you need a double tone signal generator. So you need to produce two audio tones at non-harmonically related uh, frequencies. And then they get injected into the microphone jack. I just use these little boards, nothing more than a mic jack, you know, a mic plug, the, in, the insert from a mic plug, glued, literally glued with some epoxy onto a circuit board, toggle switch so I can switch between receive and transmit, and then a BNC jack to inject the audio into the audio pin. Um, it just makes, for me, test setup very fast and easy. But that's all I'm doing here is injecting a double tone audio signal at, th at a 30 millivolts into here. And that's the other thing is both of those those two audio frequencies need to be at the exact same level. You can't have one at a really high level and the other one's at a really low level, or this test, again, won't work. Um, but So what does that actually look like? Well, you've seen, if I, it, I think in that video, I actually showed it on a scope, um, but I don't think I showed it on a spectrum analyzer or a spectrum display to show what it actually looks like. Now, this camera really does not like this service monitor <laughs> over here right here so we're gonna have to see here so do we see everything yet yeah. okay so we can see the display here and the oscilloscope down there so if I flip into transmit okay that's what we want to see we want to see non-distorted I'm trying to look through the viewfinder so I know where to point <laughs> add some reference here you see they're nice they come up, back down, they cross over. They're not flat top, so just like an AM. Now, most people know what a modulated AM waveform looks like, but they're not used to seeing sideband. So like I say, there's actually two audio tones being being transmitted. But just like with AM, you want to have a nice, it comes up, peaks, and then comes back down and crosses over. And if you look at the spectrum display, and like I say, this camera has a really hard time with this display because it's so bright. But you, yeah, you can see that. At least I can in a viewfinder, I can see it. But you can see we have two peaks, okay? That's the two, the actual two audio tones being transmitted. And then your IMD products and all your distortion products are down here. Now, look what happens as I turn the AMC, or not AMC, the ALC. Come on, get my adjuster in there. Now, what you're going to see down here on the scope and on here is this communications test set automatically changes the settings the scale as the power increases and what you'll see is down here on the scope you'll see it getting bigger and then all of a sudden it'll get small again and it'll get bigger and small again that's because the scope is attached to the uh, an output on the communications test set it has a uh, IF uh, tap off of the RF board in the communications test set and that's, so I, and that's what's actually attached to the oscilloscope over there but that's like I say that's changing as well it's all auto scaling because it's actually the signals coming out of the communications test set but let me get my adjuster back in here now. Now what you'll see is once we get to a point where these waveforms down here on the oscilloscope, you'll start to see they'll start to get they'll start to flat top. You're also going to see all these IMD products. You can see how they're already starting to pick up. Now they're fine. They're down, but they're not. You'll you'll see how much higher they'll get once we really start to distort. You'll see those waveforms over here start to flat top. So let me keep turning up. Okay, and you can see it's starting to flat top. And you can see all of the IMD products. And you can see as I keep turning up and turning up, we've got the rail cars over here. We basically just have a bunch of rectangular boxes on the oscilloscope. And you can see how horribly distorted we're getting now. You know, we're not gaining much on the actual tones that we want. You know, this would be our voice right here. All of these distortion products, however, you can see how they just keep coming up and up. And it gets, and eventually even your your signal here... If you can see it in the camera, not even the, the edges of it are starting to get fuzzy because it's distorted. And you look at the oscilloscope, like I say, just horribly distorted. And if I turn it back down, you can see how drastically they drop off. You're not losing a lot in here in the actual signal. You can see it's right about there is perfect. And right about there, it's starting, it's starting to flat top. So, like I say, that's the reason um, when you're doing an alignment, you really need... Uh, 
well, it's not really if you have to. <laughs> if you want to align sideband radios, you have to have a double tone audio source to inject signals into the radio. Uh, now, you don't have to have the spectrum analyzer. Hold on a second. Okay, I'm back. Um, yeah, like I said, you don't have to have the spectrum analyzer, but you do have to have an oscilloscope because that's what most techs would use. You'd inject your audio signal into here, you'd look at that tune, flip it into transmit here again, you know, and that's that's what you'd use as your display. You'd adjust it just like you would. It basically looks the same as if you're in AM. So actually, if I flip the radio over, try and get this all in camera here. I got a maze of cables. <laughs> everything starts to interfere with everything else. Uh, I get that in view too. Take down my mount here so the camera doesn't swing around. So the my lower, I'll switch to AM, and I'll turn off the higher frequency. Okay, yeah, we're in AM. And transmit. Uh, let me change the. Okay. And okay. So again, we can see it's not distorted, and I think uh, that this one. We'll find out. Yeah, that's that's the AMC. Okay, so there you know there again. What we don't want flat you know flat top and box cars and we bring the modulation back down, you just want in AM for it just to pinch together. They call, you often hear people say you want an X pattern where the, you know, it comes down. It basically, it looks like an X in there. Oh, come on, get in the slot there. And like I say, as you can see, as it starts to flatline in the middle, you also see it starting to pinch off at the top. And just like... In sideband, so you know, you, there you can see it's under modulated. It's not reaching, it's not, it's very close actually. When this AMC circuit's turned down the whole way, um, it's actually very close to being 100%. But right about there is perfect. And then if you look at that on the spectrum display, come on, get the, come on, white balance. Okay, yeah, we can see it. And what I'll do is, again, I'll turn the modulation up. And you can see, just like in sideband, as you start to distort, you start to get all these distortion products. You don't really gain anything here. All you're gaining, what you see when you're watt meter, you're getting, you know, looking for a swing. Everybody's all about swing. Well, yeah, all that swing is distortion. It's not It's not doing you any good here. This is, and even the carrier is not doing you any good. All of your information's in these two sidebands. So, you know, I turn it back down, and you can see, as I turn it down and I approach right at 100% modulation, right out there, you can see how how low the distortion products are. As I, as I increase the modulation, you can see it down there on the scope. We're not gaining anything here. All the gains are in distortion. Now, unless you like sounding distorted, you know, right there is perfect. Harmonics, you know, all your distortion products are very low. Your signal's clean. It looks good on an oscilloscope. And as well, if you get your modulation and your ALC circuits turned up too high, if you go out to, like, on channel 19, if you then go out and look at the frequency spectrum at 54.37 megahertz, you're going to see big increases there because that's your second harmonic. When you start to distort, that's another place where a lot of those distortion products show up is in your second. And in radios that are horrible where they've had circuits, you know, uh, have been bypassed or, you know, di disabled, you'll actually see harmonic energy out at the second, the third, the fourth, the fifth, the sixth harmonic. So, you know, just bad idea. So, you know, properly adjusting. Very, very important. Um, and not only that, not only does it make your radio sound better because it's not distorted, it's so much easier on the radio. All you do when you're making those distortion products, for starters, your radio is not going to talk any farther. Distortion does not talk farther than the, the signal, okay? <laughs> um, but it's hard on the radio, because the radio is making more power. It's not, either not on channel, or it's just distortion products. So it's not doing you any practical good, but the radio is generating all that extra energy. So AM regulators, 
your drivers, your finals, all of these components in here, voltage regulator circuits, all, you're stressing all of those components, and those are the people that you often say, yeah, I just had the finals replaced in my radio, and then six months later, or shoot, a couple weeks sometimes, you'll hear, you know, you'll be talking to them and again, yeah, I had to get my radio worked on again, that's why. That's why you hear those people, they're all, their radios are just continuously in the shop getting repaired. You can be guaranteed they've got ALC, AMC circuits disabled. They've got the, probably the carrier cranked up as high as it'll go. Adjust the radios the way they're supposed to be, and they can last you for decades without failure. This radio is a good example. It was all original parts until I recapped it. There really hadn't been anything done to this other than these two modifications. So let me get back into it. Let me finish the alignment on this, and we'll return, and I'll go over some of these little uh, add-ons that, you know, the old vintage add-ons that are in this thing. So I shall return. Okay, so the uh, transceiver alignment's been completed on this. Good work in radio. Like I say, it did work before. Um, so what I've, I've actually done to this, normal recap, remove the corrosive glue, uh, actually replaced a few pieces of wire. Um, they have inductors, very common in these radios. Uh, it's nothing more than a piece of wire laying flat on the board with a ferrite bead on it. And they always pour glue on those, and of course the glue eats the wire when it becomes corrosive. So they're very easy to change out. Just unsolder them, pop it out, slide the bead off, because it doesn't hurt the ferrite bead. Just stick in a uh, new piece of wire and solder it back in, you know, after you clean the glue off of the board. Um, let's see, had to replace the on-off volume control, squelch control, um... I guess the radio had been dropped on its faceplate at some point in time. You can see how it's kind of bowed out right there, and it's a little bent. And, yeah, the squelch control is, it just, <laughs> you can see it, there's no stop. It just keeps turning. So, uh, stuck a new one of those in. Um, also, the uh, the squelch knob itself was actually damaged, and it was hanging up on the volume control and off part. So, I stuck a new, new back part on. Um... Let's see. Oh, I did remove... I have no idea why they had this in there. <laughs> they had this, just an RCA jack, installed in a hole right here. I've since taken this out and put a plug in there to fill the hole. But they had this <laughs> attached. The other end was attached directly to the antenna connector. Ah, uh, sample port? Um, you know, I guess if you want to blow something up, <laughs> you know, like if you were if you were to hook that to a frequency counter... Yeah, most frequency counters can't handle, uh, you know, relatively high power. Um, usually you'd have a resistor, you know, a DC blocking cap and a resistor, you know, for a sample port to attenuate to signal some. But yeah, I don't know. They had this stuck on there, so that got removed. Uh, the main reason I took it off, not so much I'd be worried about a sample port. There's nothing wrong with a sample port. The problem is it's just a regular piece of wire just floating in midair. It was suspended behind the SWR board there. So for starters, this would be reflecting power into, because, uh, to get a flashlight so you can actually see it, you can see that uh, I get the light just right here at some angle. Get in a little bit closer, maybe. There, you can see the, the track that runs around there, okay? That's your SWR bridge, okay? There's power flowing through that. As it comes out of the final, goes through the 54 megahertz trap circuit, it goes through that loop right there, and then comes out and goes to the antenna connector. That's the SWR bridge. Well, if you if you install a piece of wire almost touching that, right behind that board, that's going to completely screw up the SWR meter in this thing. So yeah, another reason why this had to come out. Um, I think that was about it for parts. Like I say, there really wasn't much... Uh, really no modifications to speak of, other than the, uh, so, now that I've changed the white balance on the camera, you can actually see again, as <laughs> we're not looking at a bright screen. Uh, so it has an EEPROM modification. Uh, now this does, it only has one wire going to a switch, so this, one of the switches on the front of the radio, uh, applies power to it. Now most channel modifications, you're thinking, oh, it's got an IC in there, it's going to add, add new bands. No, but you got to remember, this thing is already, this radio already has three bands. I think what they were trying to do was, was pick up the missing A channels. So, you know, like, 
channel 19. There's a channel missing between channel 19 and channel 20. It's 19A. There's, you know, there is no CB channel 27.195. That's the missing channel. So what they did was this chip, there's a bunch of traces, you know, one ribbon cable, actually both the ribbon cables, most of the leads go down to the board. They intercept the, you know, basically your voltages coming out of the channel selector going to, because you have to remember, this has an adder circuit. There's an additional two ICs. It doesn't just have the 1450-106 IC there. It also has two more ICs down there. But basically what it's doing is intercepting the voltages and reprogramming it. And what they're, what they're doing is, is shifting the entire frequency band, all three bands. It's exactly the same. It's 140 kilocycles higher. Uh, where's a little piece of paper? I actually had to figure out exactly what they were doing with that. So, that's normal. So, you know, this would be your normal, the low, mid, and high channel. So, you know, 26515 to 955, um, normal CB and mid, and 27415 to 855 and high. But when you flip the switch that turns this on, it shifts, as you can see, 26705 to 095, 7155 to 545, and 605 to 995. So, yeah, they've just shifted the, the range up 140 kilohertz. But by doing that, you pick up the missing channels, and you gain 140 kilohertz at the top end of the band. So, it's an interesting way of doing it. Um, and it's actually solidly mounted. They have a, a stud in the middle of the IC, there's a basically a screw sticks out the bottom of it. Then they have a metal standoff. They drill a hole because in this radio could have even more bands. So there's three transformers like this that are not used in this chassis. Um, so there was no components there. So they just drilled a hole in the board there and just ran that screw down through with a standoff to hold it up. So yeah, it's securely mounted in there. Works well. A good way to pick up the A channels and add a few channels at the top end. Uh, other than that, it had. Uh, this little board, and this is a Roger Beat board. Now, this is another old school, <laughs> you know, kind of thing. Um, you'll see there's lots of controls on this. This one is your, your output, so that's basically the audio level. This controls the audio level coming out of the board. This one here is the timing, how fast it goes. This one, these, all five of these actually change the tones in the way, so I have a little radio sitting here on the bench, so if I key the microphone, let me turn the volume up on that a little bit, and then what I'll do is, is just adjust these so you can see what I mean. So, oh, this is going to be a pain in the butt. <laughs> get this camera up out of the way. i got to hold the microphone, try and get this board so it's not flopping around and doesn't short out at the same time as I key the mic here. So here's the timing. And then all of these five adjust just basically 